Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to be going over a Paul Morphy game. Uh, this game is actually uh, just Morphy versus Celso. It was played in Havana Simul in 1864. Uh, Morphy gets a chance to play one of his favorite openings. He gets a chance to play the Evans Gambit. Uh, and in this Evans Gambit, what he does is he manages to get an open position. And uh, Morphy, at his time and really any other time, was one of the most dominant players when it came to open positions in the world. If he were to play in tournaments today, I think, at least in open positions, I think he would be just as good as any other top-level player in the world. I think he would still beat people. Uh, Morphy was, was just phenomenal. If you gave Morphy an open position, Morphy just dominated that open position and just played with accuracy. And this is why we should study Morphy. Even today, his games are relevant, because he shows us how to play open positions, and he shows us how to play them well and with accuracy. Uh, Morphy understood tempo, he understood how to gain it, and he understood how to use it. So let's take a look at this game. So the game starts out e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5. And then Morphy plays his favorite opening. He plays the Evans Gambit. He plays b4. And what the Evans Gambit does is it allows uh, this bishop to have b4, but of course that takes time. And it allows white the chance to play the move c3 and d4. And white gains time to develop his pieces faster and attack the center of the board faster. And this is uh, basically Morphy's favorite opening back in the day. And it's still a fairly popular opening today. There's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So this is the Romantic era. So back then, nobody even thought of declining the gambit. Uh, I think everybody just pretty much accepted everything back then. So black plays bishop captures b4. Morphy plays c3, bishop c5. And now Morphy plays a move today that we don't uh, respect um, as much uh, as they did back then. They didn't fully understand the position back then. But basically, black wants to keep the position closed. And Castle's Kingside, which is the move that Morphy played, is kind of frowned on today. And the reason it's frowned on is because it allows something known as the Lasker Defense. And the Lasker Defense is basically Black has basically found a way to keep this position closed, which is you play the move that was played in the game, which was d6. And then after Morphy's move d4, instead of the move that was played in the game, what you do is you play bishop b6. And what this does is, since the knight is still defending the e5 square, and the bishop is now defending the a5 square, and this is critical, it makes it very difficult for white to crack open the position, at least in a meaningful way. White's usual attacking strategy here is to play a move like queen b3. But in this case, since the a5 square is held, after a move like queen b3, black could then play knight a5, hitting the queen and bishop, and then the usual attacking move that works is bishop takes f7, and then king f8, and now the knight is attacking the queen and the king is attacking the bishop and so the queen's going to have to move and when the queen moves away from the protection of the bishop normally it would be attacking an undefended knight and in this case since the bishop is defending that knight because it's on b6 there is not going to be any queen captures knight so the king would just take the bishop and white simply down a whole piece and since queen b3 is at, that, at this point out of the question after bishop b6 this effectively makes it very difficult for white to open the position in a meaningful way and there are other moves that are possible none of them have been totally satisfactory for white but basically the position stays closed and if the position stays closed the fact that white's up several tempo just doesn't seem to matter as much um, as if you manage to open the position um, today we don't have a huge problem with the lasker defense because everybody pretty much avoids it and it's not that difficult to avoid um, instead of castle's king side, we simply play the move pawn to d4 first, and then after e takes d4, now we castle. The point is, is that black doesn't have much better than to simply just go back into the main line. Um, he can do that by playing d6, or he can even play like a half compromise defense with the move knight on g to e7. But in either case, he's just going back into the main line, and we're going to have an open position, which is what we want when we're up several tempo. And so this is what people play. The Third option is I guess he could try to take everything, but people haven't been terribly scared of this, you know, for a long time. After pawn takes pawn, uh, the correct continuation would be bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, now queen d5 check. Now the king can either retreat to f8 or e8. In either case, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. White is going to follow up the same way. After, say, king f8, we're going to play queen c5, and then after d6, which if the king was on e8, this would probably still be the best move. And then queen takes c3, and white is only down one pawn, and white has more than enough compensation uh, for that one pawn, considering that the king is stuck in the middle of the board, and there's really no way out. 
Um, even, you know, if black plays moves like, say, queen f6, I think the best move is a move like, say, queen a3. And this is actually very difficult for, for black. He can't develop his pieces in a, a normal or natural way, and he certainly can't take the rook on a1 because bishop b2 would trap the queen. And it's, this is a very good position for white, and people just haven't had a problem here at all. So going back to the game, Morphy castled. His opponent played the correct move d6, and then after d4, instead of playing the correct move, which was simply retreating his bishop, he transposed back into uh, the main line, which is e takes d4. And then after c takes d4, we have an open position, and everything is fine. So the bishop goes back to b6, and at this point, this is a huge crossroads in the Evans Gambit. We have basically four main moves here. There's a couple of other minor tries, but basically there's four main moves. And those main moves are d5, knight to c3, bishop b2, and h3. And... I want to discuss two of the moves that were not played in the game uh, a little bit. One move that certainly leads to an advantage, and actually all four of these moves lead to some kind of advantage for Wyatt. One of these moves that leads to an advantage is uh, d5, and it's kind of frowned on today, and it's frowned on kind of for no good reason. The reason they frown on it is because it blocks the light squared bishop, and a lot of people just think that's just dumb. I mean, in the uh, any kind of, kind of Italian game or Evans Gambit, this light squared bishop is a star player, so why in the world would I block it? Um, and the answer is it's, it's it's pretty obvious. It's to gain space. And space in chess is an advantage, just period. So plenty of strong players have played d5, and plenty of strong players have gotten an advantage by playing d5. Because simply having more space is, is worth something. Um, and in this case, I would argue that, that white has enough space and enough development that it's probably worth a pawn. Um, he's, he's gained space, and he's created a bad piece on c4, but he's also created a good a good bishop. This bishop is going to go to b2, and it's going to control the long diagonal, and that, that definitely has to be a good thing. So he made one bad piece, but he made one good piece. So I think, I think uh, d5 is a perfectly legitimate way to play for an advantage. And I think uh, the people that are against d5, they'll simply make the claim they think the other moves are simply better. And I think this is a little misleading because the other moves have problems as well. Um, so I think there's 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 upsides and there's downsides to all four main tries. And I think all four main tries are completely legitimate ways to play for an advantage. Another move that doesn't get played as much as it should, although it, it does get it does get played, it is still one of the four main moves, is the move uh, h3. And what h3 does is it just says, look, this pawn duo in the middle is an advantage, and I just want to keep it. And I just want to prevent the move bishop g4. And actually in the main line with knight c3, bishop g4 is the main move. So I just want to prevent bishop g4. And in so doing, I'm just going to maintain this pawn center. That's all I'm going to do. Because this pawn duo is the most important thing in the position. And if I maintain it, and it's fluid, and it's mobile, I'll have a huge advantage. And for the most part, that's true. Uh, this game shows just exactly how powerful the pawn duo is. And it shows how to mobilize it. It shows how to use it. It shows how to use it to get a huge advantage in an open position. And it just demonstrates how valuable it is. And this move h3, it should be familiar. If any of you are familiar with the Roy Lopez, we play this in the Roy Lopez all the time. And for the same reason, simply to maintain this pawn duo in the middle of the board. And actually starting people that played h3 in this position in the Evans Gambit, this is what started the uh, theory of the Roy Lopez. So anyways, going back um, to the main line, so he, right here, again, this position, this is known as the normal position. This is what they called it back then, and I think even today we still call it the so-called normal position. Morphy played the most popular move then and the most popular move now. He just developed a piece. He played the move knight to c3. Now, at this point, black did not play the best move, but nonetheless, he played a move that looks totally and completely logical. The best move is just bishop g4, pinning this knight and putting pressure on the d4 square. So what his opponent played was his opponent played the move uh, knight to f6, just developing a piece. And this is this is a mistake. And, um, you know, if any of my students are listening, you know, I've discussed this before. You know, it's, um, you know, you have two pieces attacking the center of the board, attacking d4. And then, so if you're having to choose to develop a third piece, you want to develop a piece that coordinates with the two pieces that you already have out. So bishop g4 is, of course, the, the most logical move. Knight f6 actually doesn't fit with a, with a plan right now, except the plan of maybe trying to get the king out of the middle, which is a legitimate plan, because the king does need to get out of the middle. But knight f6 certainly doesn't facilitate that, and that's what 
Morphe's next move shows, which is he just immediately attacks that knight with the move e5, and this is a big problem. Black captures that pawn, doesn't have much better, he either does that or he moves the knight, and then Morphe keeps this king locked in the middle with the move bishop a3, he just says, nope, you're not getting out of the center. And now this king is stuck in the middle of the board, and white has a huge development lead in white's castled. And this is a big, big problem. So this is the romantic era of chess. So, so black's response to this was uh, not the world's greatest move, but it's kind of what they did back then. He just took more stuff. He played bishop takes d4, and that is not to be recommended. If you have a problem with your king in the middle of the board in an open position, your priority needs to be to figure out a way to get that king out of the middle of the board. I would have probably desperately played something like bishop e6 or something just to get the king out of the middle find a way to get this king out of the middle anything just anything you can do to get the king out of the middle i don't know what it is but that's the priority bishop d4 is not a priority so then queen b3 hitting f7 and now already we have a huge issue white's threatening mate in two that's never a good thing. You're this early in the game, so white's already threatening mate in two. If, for example, bishop takes c3, bishop f7, king d7, queen e6 is mate. So black has to block this mate. So how is black going to block this checkmate threat? Well, really, there's there's not that many choices. Objectively, the best move would be something like queen d7. Of course, if you play queen d7, you can't castle either wing anymore. Um, you're not going to be able to castle queenside because the queen is blocking the bishop, and you can't castle kingside because the bishop's cutting you off. At this point, objectively, the best move would just be something simple, like rook ae1. And then after rook ae1, you just mechanically pry open the e-file. And, and Morphe demonstrates how easy this was to do just in the game itself. He actually demonstrates just how easy it is to mechanically pry open this e-file. And once that e-file is pried open, it's pretty much a wrap. If you look at this on the computer for more than five minutes, it's um, actually you end up uh, in many variations, you just end up eventually winning the queen. It's, it's very It's very ugly. Um, so it's understandable that his opponent played the move that he should have played maybe maybe a move ago, um, and it's certainly not as good now. He played the move bishop e6, just trying to stop the attack and get stuff off the board, and also trying to clear out material so he can kind of get his king over to the queen side. And of course this is disastrous. So Morphe takes, takes, queen takes his check, and there's not that many ways to block. You can block with the queen, but of course bishop takes queen, you're down a whole queen. Um, in the game he blocked with the knight. And now Morphe just plays a brutally accurate move in an open position. He just cracks open that e-file with the move knight takes d4. And that cracks open the d-file because there is no queen takes knight because queen takes e7 is mate. So now that basically forces pawn captures knight. After pawn captures knight, Morphe just continues with rook fe1. Just hitting everything on e7. And now there's just really no way to defend. Uh, an alternative to the game move was he could have played knight fg8 and this just isn't much better after knight fg8 he would just take on e7 knight takes e7 knight d5 and this is completely over as well i guess another potential alternative to the game is he could have played pawn capture c3 but then just bishop takes e7 is also over so the move that he played which is understandable is he just plays queen d7 just trying to get queens off the board and of course this immediately loses a piece just queen takes e7 queen e7 rook e7 king d8 and then just another brutally accurate move from Morphe. He just develops a piece and gains a tempo. Uh, he plays the move rook d1. And still, look, these two rooks they haven't played. His opponent's just trying to run away from this attack. So he's just still, he's, he's down a piece, but he's still running. b6, just trying to create a space for this king to go. Also maybe hoping that he can play c5, but just rook takes d4 check, king c8, knight b5, continuing the attack on c7. And then king b8. And then what he's hoping for with king b8 is he's actually hoping that Morphe played the move that he actually played in the game, which is rook takes c7, hoping to cross up his pieces with the move a6. But of course, Morphe just calculates very accurately, and he just sees, well, of course I can play rook takes c7. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. There, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of resources available. And that's what you're supposed to do if you can take something, you take it. So he plays rook c7, rook e8, and this is part of what I think his opponent thought he missed. He's going to cross him up with both rook e8 and a6, but of course rook e8 threatens mate. Uh, Morphe sees that, he blocks the mate threat, and then a6 crossing up all of his pieces. And I think he liked the idea that he had this additional control with e, you know, you'll see in a second, but none of it works. And so a6 crossing him up, this is all part of the plan though. Bishop b6, just hitting the king. This is just so over. And then I guess this is one last attempt to cross him up knight e4, but this is very desperate. And Morphe just, just puts an end to it. He just takes it. 
And then after rook takes c4, we have rook e7, check. Hitting the king, king c8 is forced. There's, there's no other legal move. Uh, king c8, rook takes rook, and this rook can't even move. Um, so he just takes the knight, nothing better. And then all of the rest of the pieces come off the board. And at this point, black resigns, and he absolutely should. Uh, white's just going to play f4, f5, g4, create a pass pawn on the king side, and black's down a whole piece and has absolutely no compensation whatsoever. Um, so this was a good game. This, this showed us how to play a, an open position. It showed us how to play an open position with brutal accuracy. It showed us um, how to, you know, how to play like Morphe. You know, you gain a few tempo in the opening, and that lo allows you to gain a few more. And this is just how you win games. This is still how you play open positions today. So I hope that this game was helpful. I hope you learned something. Um, and uh, I, I hope that this helps your chess game. Uh, thank you.